Hello everyone, my name is Howard. I'm from SPS Project Committee here, bringing you another physics review video on rotational dynamics. What is rotational dynamics? One classic example of rotational dynamics would be the classroom door, as you can see in the picture, where you would either pull or push the door to rotate around the axis. Another classic example of ro rotational motion would be merry-go-round, which will be shown on this picture here. Where you will stand on the side of merry-go-round, you will need to pull harder in order to stay on it, or you are going to fall when it rotates super fast. So why is that so? Today we are here to explain the, the physics behind this phenomenon. The first concept in rotational dynamics is torque. Torque is similar to force. We can think of torque as a force in the world of rotation. Torque is calculated using force and lever arm distance, as you can see in this picture. We take the perpendicular component of the applied force and multiply it to the lever arm length, which is formed where the force is applied to the rotational axis. In this case, will be x. That's your lever arm. We can make the analogy of the equation torque is equal to force times distance to our classroom door example. When we push or pull the door, we apply a perpendicular force to the surface of the door. If we push or pull the door further away from the axis, we apply a greater torque, so we push the door easier. This is also why the door handle is not on the middle of the door but rather on the side, because you will apply a higher torque. The next concept in rotational dynamics is angular acceleration. Angular acceleration is often represented using the symbol alpha, and is similar to linear acceleration but instead of meter per second square, we will have theta per second square. Angular acceleration measures the change in angular velocity of a rotating object over time. It is quite a simple concept. As you can see, you can make reference between angular acceleration equation and linear acceleration equations. One of the most important concepts in rotational dynamics is the moment of inertia. Moment of inertia tells the tendency of the object to rotate. An object with a low moment of inertia tends to rotate easier. Conversely, when an object has a high moment of inertia, it is harder to rotate it. Let's start simply by calculating the moment inertia of a particle rotating in a circular motion, as you can see in the picture. The moment inertia of the particle in this particular case is mass times radius squared. We can look at this equation and think logically that when the particle is heavier or when it is further away from the axis of rotation, it is harder to keep it rotating in a circle. It turns out that if we have a physical object instead of a particle, the formula for the moment of inertia is i is equal to the sum of m r squared. We take every particle's moment of inertia and combine it. To solve this equation, most of the time we have to use calculus. However, some well-known geometric objects have a simple moment of inertia formula. For example, for a loop, you would have m r squared. For a disk, it will be half m r squared. And for a sphere, is 2 over 5 times mr squared. Connecting what we learn about torque, angular acceleration, and moment of inertia, we can see that when the moment of inertia is high, the angular acceleration will be smaller when we apply some sort of constant torque to rotate the object. We can come up with this formula, torque is equal to I alpha. Notice it is similar to F is equal to ma, and in fact, the formula for torque is another version of F is equal to ma, but in the world of rotation. The trick to memorize torque is equal to I alpha is to remember that it is similar to F is equal to ma. The next concept, vertical axis theorem, is relatively important in rotational dynamics. When we want to find the moment of inertia of a sphere rotating around a line tangent to its surface, we cannot use the original formula for the moment of inertia, as you can see in the picture here. Since we're not rotating around the center of mass of the sphere, 
you can apply the vertical axis theorem to find a new i. The vertical axis theorem states that when rotating around a new axis that is parallel to the original axis, the new i, i new, is equal to the original moment of inertia plus mass times distance square, where distance will be the distance between the two axes. In this case, for our sphere, our moment of inertia will be i nu is equal to 2 over 5 mr square plus mr square, which will be 7 over 5 mr square. And always remember, the axis must be parallel. Following vertical axis theorem, there is another theorem to calculate the moment of inertia of a plan planar lamina object. The perpendicular axis theorem states that the moment of inertia of a planar lamina about an axis that is perpendicular to the plane, which in this case will be axis Z, is equal to the sum of the moments of inertia of the lamina rotating about the two axes at right angle to each other inside its own plane, which in this case inside the plane will be the axis X and Y. As you can see, the moment of inertia for the object to rotate around Z is equal to the sum of the object rotating around Y axis plus the moving inertia rotating around the x-axis. This theorem is not often seen, but it is good to know what it is and makes use of it in some cases. For example, of this disk problem, as we all know, the moving inertia for the disk rotating about the z-axis is half mr square. How do we get this equation? We can get it by finding the moment of inertia rotating around the x-axis and the moment of inertia rotating around the y-axis in this case will be the same and we add them up together we can get half mr square hello we are back to going over a practice problem that is the Wies physics 7a spring 2014 midterm 2 problem 3 and this problem deals with rotational dynamics so we'll be going over them so there is a thin rotating object, as you can see in the picture down here, that has a mass m, uniform mass density rho, thickness t, and longest dimension 2l, and has a moment of inertia rotating about the z-axis, given by 0.2 ml square and rotation about the x-axis, given by 0.3 ml square. Part A of the question asks, what is the moment of inertia i y when it rotates about the y-axis? So, because the object looks like a planar object, and we were given what is Ix and what is Iz, we can quickly apply the perpendicular axis theorem to figure out what is the moment of inertia rotating about the y-axis. So, the rotation about the y-axis, when we apply the perpendicular axis theorem, is the sum of x-axis and z-axis, which they were given in the question, and we can just add them up together to get half ml square. Part B of the question asks, if four holes of radius r are now, are now drilled in this object, which they are removed, in other words, so that the center of each hole is a distance d from the center of mass of the object as, showing, as shown in the right panel of the figure, what is the resulting moment of inertia i, y, nu about the y-axis for the object? To approach this question, Due to the fact that the center of mass of the object is at the origin and the four objects are drilled out of it, we can think about it as being Iy nu is equal to the original moment of inertia Iy subtracting the moment of inertia of the four hole. And so, because each hole is a circular shape and the object has a thickness t in it, we can treat it as a cylinder object. So when each hole is a cylinder that when it rotates about its own axis, which I wrote it as I hole naught, we have the formula half mr squared, which mass will be rho, the mass density times the volume, which will be pi r squared t, t will be the thickness of the object. And we can come up with this formula, half rho pi t r to the fourth power. Now, due to the fact that each object was not actually rotating about its own axis. It was rotating about the center of mass of the object. We have to apply the 
vertical axis theorem. And in this case, we, we were rotating a distance d away from the center of axis of the cylinder or of the hole. And so to apply the vertical, vertical to apply the parallel axis theorem, vertical parallel axis theorem, we have I hole is equal to the I hole naught plus MD square. And we'll be having the original I hole naught as half rho pi T times R to the fourth power plus mass times D square. And in this case, our mass is the same, which will be rho times pi R square T. And adding them up together, we get I of the, the moving inertia of a single hole, which will be pi rho times t times r square times half r square plus d square. Going back to our original thought, we say we can find the i y nu, the new moving inertia, by subtracting them off from the original one. So in this case, it will be pretty simple. We take the original moving inertia from problem one, half a mile square. And we we'll subtracted what we just got, but multiply by four since there is four hole that was drilled. Okay, and part C of the problem asks if a force F pointing straight down is now applied to the point on the object that is height h above and this is d across to the center of mass as shown in the diagram, then what is the magnitude of the resulting torque just from this force alone on the object? And so for part C of the question, it's actually easier than we all thought because when we talk about torque, we want to find the applied force times the distance that is perpendicular to the applied, where the applied force is applied, right? And this perpendicular distance is also known as a lever arm. And in this case, if we're finding the magnitude, we can just take F times D. And from the diagram, it's pretty obvious that the distance is D and as perpendicular to how the force F is applied. The reason why we don't care about height H is because D is perpendicular to F already. It doesn't matter what H is. And the magnitude in this case will be F times D, which will give us DF. And coming to part D of the problem, which is actually the hardest part, ask if the object is balanced on the ground as shown in the right panel, then what is the minimum coefficient of static friction between the object and the ground for the object to start rolling without slippery right as the force is first applied? And we were told that we can express the moving inertia I, Y, nu rather than using the full expression what we figured out in part B. And so to approach part D of the problem, we can first draw a free body diagram, which is shown right here. We have the force of gravity, mg, pointing downward, as well as the force F, even though it's applied on the side, but if we just look at in the x and y direction, you can see that force F was applied on the center of mass downward. And there's also a normal force upward, as well in including the frictional force that is against the motion. And in this, in this case, it's also horizontal. And so to start off, we can break down the diagram and see and ask ourselves, what is the sum of the force in the X direction? And when we write F is equal to MA, we realize that in the X direction, in the horizontal direction, we only have force of friction. And that is equal to the mass of the object times the acceleration of the center of mass, which since we already drilled out the four hole, our mass of the object is just M minus four times the density times volume. And when we get to the y direction, we have y has a three kind of force. First is Fn, normal force pointing upward, subtracting off the force that we actually applied on an object, and the force mg, which will be the force of gravity. And the reason why this is equal to zero is because our acceleration in the y direction is zero when it first starts rolling. Now onto the third part, when we look at rotation of the object, here is when it becomes really interesting. As we learn from the lesson that torque is equal to angular acceleration times alpha, 
Our object had i, y, nu as the moment of inertia. Oh, sorry, it was uh, angular momentum, not angular momentum. Uh, moment inertia times alpha. So our object had uh, a moment of inertia, i, y, nu, and we're multiplying that to the alpha, which in this case is angular acceleration of the object when it first starts rolling. <laughs> and so what is our torque? Our torque, first torque, will be the force that we actually applied onto the object, F, where we figure out in part C, the magnitude of it is D times F. But then there's also a rotation due to the frictional force that was applied onto the object. In this case, friction was against the motion, so we will be subtracting off force of friction and the static friction too. Multiplying the lever arm of the friction, in this case, will be from the center of mass all the way to the ground level, and that length is L. We were told in the question that the longest dimension is 2L, so we know that the distance from the center of mass to the ground is L. And then continuing on, Alpha in this case is angular, acceler oh, angular acceleration times L will give us the linear acceleration ACMX. But if we just want angular acceleration, it will be the linear acceleration of the object in the horizontal direction divided by, by the length, which in this case also acting as a radius. The reason why we're doing this is because we're considering the case as no slippery. And so, how do we approach the problem now when we figure out the net force in the x direction, y direction, and also the rotation of the object? Well, we can see that force of friction, static friction, is equal to the minimum coefficient of static friction, which was also asked in the problem, we want to find the minimum amount of minimum mu, and multiplying that coefficient of static friction to the normal force, we can get friction. In other words, we can say the coefficient of static friction is equal to the frictional force divided by the normal force when it starts rolling. So, Finding what frictional force is first. So frictional force, if we look at the equation we derived from rotation, we can see that df minus the frictional force times L was equal to I y nu times frictional force over M over L. Well, where do we get this frictional force over M? We can see that linear acceleration was indeed frictional force over M. So linear acceleration over L, in other words, will be frictional force over M over L. Rearranging the equation here, moving the frictional force times L to the other side, we have DF is equal to the frictional force times I Y nu over M L plus L. We just factor out frictional force. And continuing on, our frictional force will be df divided by i y nu over m l plus l. And this will be our frictional force for now. Besides frictional force, we'll also need to find what normal force is. And normal force is actually relatively easier because from the y direction equation we wrote, our normal force is just f plus mg. By knowing what frictional force is and what normal force is, we can just quickly say that our coefficient of static friction and minimum is frictional force over normal force. And taking the two equations we just derived is which will be df over i y nu m l plus l times one over f plus mg. And that will be our final answer. And I hope this example was really uh, was helpful and it really covers the all the important lessons in rotational dynamics and this will be the end of the video. Thank you everyone.